Hi, everybody. Thank you for, for having me today. I'm pretty excited, actually, to kind of share about our, our story. So I'm, I'm Richard Reinders. I'm the Security Operations Manager at uh, Looker. Just like everybody who has a, uh, an uh, actual Tinder profile, I like long walks and hiking and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, sometimes I like to I work at Looker uh, and have a, a variety of responsibilities, anything from log collection and monitoring, which is a big part of why I'm here today, to instant response, forensics, vulnerability management, and some endpoint protection as well. Previously, I, I led the team that was responding to the 2016 uh, breaches at Yahoo, which is, of course was an, an interesting time, and I like making things better. So at Looker, we, we have several major strategic initiatives. Um, one started over a year ago, where we realized we didn't want to be in only AWS, we wanted to be in all the clouds, major clouds. Uh, we had customers who, for various reasons, didn't uh, want to be or couldn't be in AWS. We had customers who had their data in uh, Google Cloud. We had customers who had a lot of credits with Azure. And so we decided we wanted to be where our customer wanted to be. So that, that was one major item for us. A second item was we had our SOC 2 Type 2 for AWS, um, but we wanted to have uh, more certifications. You know, if we're going to be in Google Cloud, we want to have our SOC 2 Type 1 there as well. We want it to be PCI compliant and ISO and so on. So there's a lot of work that's in, involved with that uh, as well. And finally, we were moving from a single tenant model that had previous served us quite well to a multi-tenant model using Kubernetes and that provides the customer some benefits around upgrades and availability and scalability and it provides us some benefits as well around things like utilization rates and, and so on. So to support all of this we had to rebuild our entire monitoring infrastructure and I'll be talking a bit more about that uh, today as, as well. So we had questions. Um, we actually care a lot about security and we do a lot with security but are we compliant and we want to make sure that we were um, what does a GKE stack driver log even look like well we discovered it's a JSON format it's actually rather pretty and uh, has a lot of rich context how do we do this in orderly fashion because we, we can't just shut down what we have and then you know just wait a couple months and then fully build up what we're, we're putting in place. And who's going to, to partner with us to, to help us in, in this regard? So our, our existing environment, even if we didn't have customers in Azure, we were in Azure. Even though our customers weren't necessarily in GCP, we were already in, in GCP and of course AWS as well. So we had to cover those environments. Um, my team is responsible for our production environment, but also our corporate environment, which is a whole different set of information to, to work with as well. Our main application, the Looker product, is done in Java, but we have some Node as well. We have people in Ops using Python and Ansible and, and things of that nature. And there's, there's different programming languages that get used, and that has a different impact. So we end up with a wide range of information that we bring into Sumo Logic in a consistent fashion. Anything from Box and file downloads from there, to G Suite and other productivity tools, to Azure AD, single sign-on, OS query for visibility on a, on a host, load balancers, uh, and uh, security applications like StackRox, for example, which it was nice to see that they're over there today as well. So why did we end up in, in kind of a sumo world? Um, support was a, a big key for us. It's really nice to have a support department that responds and cares and, and helps you out. We also had a vision about a single pane of glass, and we took that very seriously. And so we wanted everything to flow from the various sources and come to one point where an analyst or an engineer could look at that. And it wouldn't matter whether it was something that was maybe in G Suite, so they wouldn't have to go to the G, G Suite admin uh, page, or something that was maybe in, in Palo Alto or, or something else. It all had to be in, in Sumo, and that provides us benefits down the line as well. We also had a variety of use cases and I'll talk about the MITRE ATT&CK framework a little bit and how, how we approach some of that and because we were freed up to now have that single source of information, that single source of alerts, we can now also craft a uh, simple straightforward response and I'll talk a little bit about how we view 
container response. And finally, it was kind of the pricing engineering features balance that we had to strike. You know, if I'm going to get Elk, I'm going to also have to get a bunch of engineers, and I'm not going to get a lot out of the box, but it, maybe my top line price is a little lower. On the flip side, you know, we have a small team. We are not, you know, we like to think we're good, but we're not the smartest. We can learn from everybody. And, you know, that whether it's things that are out of the box, whether it's a dashboard and a great way of parsing CloudTrail API names or something else, we wanted to learn uh, from people. And we ended up in this really sweet spot, and we're, we're happy that we, we did. So the MITRE ATT&CK framework, I, I think if you've seen Yaron's talk yesterday, he talked a little bit about what the MITRE ATT&CK framework is, but um, at a 30,000 foot view, there's an attacker life cycle, there's certain steps that they take in certain phases, and as part of that, you respond to it. And this is a snapshot of a part of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Because all of our OS query logs are, and all of the logs from the various sources are all going into that same space now, and that same pipeline, and that same consistency, we can now write one rule to say, okay, is somebody um, doing sudo in our environment? And we know that when we have that one rule, it's checking all of our clouds, all of our environments, anywhere it, it may be. Um, I'm going to go off track just, just slightly uh, for a second on the MITRE ATT&CK framework because I see it becoming really popular and a lot of vendors are, are talking about this. And, and one thing that I've, I've found is, is that when a vendor starts saying that they do the MITRE ATT&CK framework, that's interesting because that could save you a lot of effort potentially if they are already doing it. Um, but one thing I, I would ask for is to, to get an actual map of which pieces of the MITRE ATT&CK framework they do. What tactics do they incorporate? And within each tactic, which stages and steps do they, they actually do uh, that the various attack groups perform. So anyways, that's my little segue on, on the MITRE ATT&CK framework and, and something that we've been running into. Um, so then there's container forensics. So we, we realized, okay, Kubernetes, multi-tenancy, that generally creates security concerns. How do you keep your customer separated? So we solved for that. Um, you know, we, it, it, the container doesn't live very long, so you, know, you need to do a vulnerability scan, but by the time your weekly scan comes back, the container doesn't even exist anymore, and what are you going to tell the ops team? And so you know, we went and we, we solved for that. Then you know, we, we realized we've got a lot to be grateful for. We, we've never had any kind of breach or major incident or, or anything like that. But you know, realistically speaking, bad things are going to happen to everybody, regardless of how much you care and how much you do your best. So we wanted to be ready for that. And we, we realized with Kubernetes there was an opportunity. Whether that container is running in GCP or AWS or, or Azure, we know the registry that that image is at. We know where it's, it's stored. And when the container is running, we have context. We know, you know what cluster it is in and what version it is and what the source image is. And so if we get an alert, we can now say, let's take the original, let's take a snapshot of the existing running container, and let's compare the two and see what kind of file changes there have been, what has been added, what has been deleted, what has been um, you know, modified. And you get to a, a fairly short list of files, actually, because you know what the original is. And maybe it's 50 files. And then we, we added this whitelisting component. We said, OK, you know, for Postgres, it has a lock file, tends to be size 0. You know where it is. And you can start checking for that. So we can whitelist those particular uh, uh, things. And now, when there's an issue or an alert, an analyst is left with a, a couple of artifacts to review and make sure that there's nothing strange that's, that's going on. So simple solution that we were able to build because we could do this now. So I, I don't know what the hip word is for this, but I, I think it's been called chat DevSecOps, this idea where you, you're living out of Slack for your alerts. Um, for us, it wasn't really driven to be um, cool. Um, for us, it was really more of um, a want and a necessity it's not fun to be on call, especially if you have a small team and you don't want to get woken up in the middle of the night, turn on your laptop, log in, do your multi-factor, do et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of painful when you're trying to sleep. On the flip side, we wanted people to make a balanced decision. Is this risky? Is this not a problem or is it a problem? So because we have everything funneling into to Sumo now and we have the alerting consistent, we can now do consistent Slack alerts. We can then run it through something like an Ops Genie or a PagerDuty. We can get paged. And I can see in Slack all the context of what's, what's going on. Now, today we're at a stage where we're saying, OK, 
We see in Slack something's going on. It's not just a basic administrative change. We think this is odd for our environment. Um, and now we can trigger that kind of container response or whatever we want. There's a, a bot in Slack and it just listens to what, what the instructions are. And if you're an approved person, then that's fine. So this is Roy kicking off a, um, a response on a, on a container that, that we have. Um, so again, that's something that we're able to do that we weren't able to do properly before. But we, we learned some things along the way. Um, one was, because we wanted to get these certifications, we decided to meet with our auditors early to understand, okay, really what are the controls you're looking for and what do those controls mean and what, you, what are you trying to achieve uh, with all of this? And just by having some simple conversations that really took us only a few hours to cover for three major certifications, um, we were able to prepare for that. And as we were rolling this out, it really made our life easier. So for our SOC 2 Type 1, which we have a blog post up uh, today uh, in GCP, um, there was zero findings related to all the, the log work uh, that we've did, all the monitoring and the response and, and so on. And it's nice to have independent people review that work. Um, we've done our ISO 27001 audit. Again, no findings. And we're working on, on PCI uh, right now. So we're pleased with how that went. Um, plan, plan, plan. Like we, we really found out you know, that, that that helped us. We, we did a good job on planning on our sources. We kind of knew what we wanted to gather and how we wanted to gather it. We did a decent job on our pipeline. We had to make some adjustments along the way, but that, that part we're pretty happy with. Um, but the destination part is something that we, we could have done better at. So Sumo Logic is very powerful, and you can really uh, use the flexibility there to, to optimize things. And I think as we got to know more about Sumo, we realized just how much stuff we could be doing that we weren't necessarily doing yet. And so planning for that when there's a new initiative, um, I think next time we'll, we'll be sure to do it. Uh, another thing that we did was we, we gathered support around the organization, but we took a different model. Normally when, when you say, I've got this giant project and a large initiative and you're trying to get people to do stuff, everybody's like, well, we're busy, can't get it all done. So we, we, we took a different uh, tack. Because uh, we like working with the various teams, but we don't want them to feel overloaded. We did the project plan, we did the organizing, and then we told them, hey, there's going to be three tasks that this team needs to perform. There's four tasks that team needs to perform. Um, how do you want it? Do you want me to send you an email, or would you like some JIRA tickets, or how do you want this done? And now they knew there was a big initiative, and they wanted to support it, but it became a very manageable thing, and it allowed us to, to ramp up pretty quickly. Finally, and I, I bolded this, is really you want to design for consistency. And I, I mentioned some consistency things, like making sure your logs are formatted right and that you're getting everything and that you, know, that you can do your queries in a way that you're covering all your environments. But it, it's everywhere. Um, you know, if you've got dashboards, you want to have a consistent folder structure that everybody is sharing and seeing the same things. If somebody has a one-off rule, that's great. But if it's part of your day-to-day, -day, part of your operations, you got to make that part of your, your folder structure and, and, uh, and deal with that. And this is, I think, where a lot of these kinds of solutions start to, to fall down. People start doing one-off things. You start missing stuff. You're checking a box on compliance saying, yeah, we're looking for uh, administrative changes. But are you really looking for all administrative changes, or are you just checking a box? And, and finally, uh, optimizing all the things. Um, it seems to, to really make people happy whenever we have a... Uh, a search, a query, it takes a little bit of time. We talk with Sumo, how do we make it go fast? And it really starts going fast and it's, it's really paid off for us and happy analysts and happy engineers, they tend to get their, their work done a lot more, more quickly. So I'm gonna highlight it uh, again because it, it's, it's really, I, I think, core to being successful with this. You really wanna design uh, things cons to be consistent, you wanna implement it to be consistent and you wanna maintain that consistent environment. So you don't want to have to go back a year from now and find out that you've got janitor duties and you've got to sweep things up uh, again because everybody just went off and, and did their own thing. Um, then let's, let's see. I think we have a clicker issue. Um, could we maybe roll to the next slide for... Oh, we got it. All right, saving money. So one of the things that we, we realized we could do is um, if we improve our pipeline, we could be saving a lot of money and then we can pour that into other initiatives or, or put more into to Sumo. Um, we realized that by having a hosted collector of Sumo and uh, the uptime being very high, 
um, we would have a higher reliability without having to do all this redundancy type stuff. So in a, our previous situation, we would have these large, large sensors, cost a lot of money every month from, from Amazon, and they would go down every couple of weeks for an update. And that was not acceptable to, to us. So we built in all this caching on the host of volumes uh, and along the entire pipeline to make sure that we would never miss anything. Even if there was an outage, it would catch back up. And, and we didn't have to do a lot of that stuff now. And so that decreased our storage requirements, uh, uh, help of data duplication, then it's less stuff to secure. And uh, yeah, we ended up with a lot of savings all along our, our pipeline by just getting rid of that kind of stuff. And then finally, uh, maintaining that pipeline, keeping that pipeline uh, healthy. We decided we were gonna share the logs we were collecting with everybody because very often security comes up with an initiative and says, I need all the logs, give me your stuff. And by the way, you're gonna do the work to start sending the logs and making sure it's correct. And it's kind of a painful conversation to have. You're trying to get somebody to do something and you're not sharing. So we decided we were gonna share. And we found that for certain areas, well, maybe they weren't quite ready yet to use it. But there's other teams that actually really liked it. They didn't have a solution, and they were more than happy to use whatever you have. In exchange, they become these advocates. They, they want to know that the logs are in there. If they think there's an issue, they're going to tell you right away. If there's a new feature or something else that you may not be gathering, they're going to tell you before you ever know you might be missing something. And, and so different teams using the data helps you to maintain the pipeline. And, uh, it changes the dynamic. Before, if you're asking for help and you're asking for getting all the things, it's very much a, a one-way street and it's a lot of politics. If you're just saying, hey, we're going to give you access, it's, it's a user access problem. And help desks around the world have solved that problem already. It's, it's a lot easier to, to deal with, especially for the long term. Now, in the future, um, you know, we, we want to do more. So today, it's chat, DevSec, ops. But really what I would like is I, I'd like it to be auto response. So if something bad happens, we, we automatically drive that change through Sumo Logic and, and get the improvement that we need. And finally, you know, our, our engineers love it, you know, managers love it, but I'd like to get to a point where you know, I don't have to make a slide anymore for, for leadership, like how are we doing? They can just go into Sumo, they can see the dashboard for themselves and make up their own mind. On, on how we're, we're doing. And so that's, that's next steps for, for us. And that's, that's all I had. I, I don't have a SoundCloud, but I'm on LinkedIn, and I get the feeling I might be available over here later as well. Uh, we, we can actually, we have enough time to uh, take a, a couple of questions. If you have any questions, I have a microphone. Yeah. Um, what issues were, way, were you weighing against choosing Sumo? I love Sumo, I'm not, but I'm wondering what, in your decision process, was there anything that you thought maybe wouldn't work for Sumo? Something that like would, a reason why we might not go with Sumo? So one of the things that, that I was concerned about when I was first starting on this whole Sumo thing was, was I actually gonna be supported or was I gonna get a sales pitch? And this is, this is one of my beefs that I have generally with vendors, but particularly in the Kubernetes space. Every vendor t has been telling me, yes, we work with Kubernetes and it, we support it and it's great. And then I would get to trial and it wouldn't work. And, and so I was very sensitive um, to that. So that was, was one of my concerns. And I ended up spending a lot more time than Val should have put up with in the first place. But um, it, it was worth it for me to just get my comfort level up. So that, that was one of my big ones. No problem. More questions? I have a question. Right. Um, you, you talked a lot about consistency. Yeah. And you talked about uh, doing uh, uh, regulatory compliance across multiple, multiple clouds. Do you have any uh, words of advice of people that are going down the same path, which is starting the process of uh, initiating compliance, SOC 2 or other PCI or otherwise, yeah. across multiple cloud. Do you have any recommendations for sequencing, doing them at the same time, how to leverage Sumo to get consistency and, uh, and mm -hmm. efficiency through those multiple processes? Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of variables there, right? Like you may not be in a position where you have to do three of them in one summer or there may be some other things, but um, there's a couple of considerations um, that, that we had. Um, so one decision that we made was to, uh, as we got our feet wet, 
we would first use the basic logging pipelines that already existed. So we would use CloudWatch and StackDriver and so on, and then pipe that to Sumo. And then as you know, usage went up, then we might you know, switch over to uh, a more efficient and better way of, of having that, that data move. So that was one consideration for us, because often the business wants you to do something and you want to do it right, but you don't feel like you have enough time. So that's like our shortcut, if you will. Um, we get the visibility, we can truthfully say we're seeing what we need to say, um, but that's definitely one. Um, a second thing is, is you, you can't really boil the ocean. Like I would not do the MITRE attack framework and multi-cloud and, and, and all at the same time. Like this is really a culmination of something that's been going on for over a year now. Um, so yeah, the certifications, they all came in, in a very short period of time, but the rest has been baking for a while. We have a question. So I'm a big fan of MITRE, and uh, I'd like to hear your a uh, little more in depth on your criticism of how other vendors are implementing MITRE or saying that they're implementing MITRE. Okay, um, so my criticisms of, of MITRE. So for, for one, I think, I, I will say I think MITRE is a really good framework, um, and I think it's useful, and I, I think people should do it. Um, but yes, people are jumping on this MITRE ATT&CK framework bandwagon and they're only covering a couple items. And if you start really digging into the MITRE ATT&CK framework, some things are very granular. Like are you using source or trap or pseudo commands? Well, it's like, okay, we know how to monitor for that. But there's a, there's a tactic that is just called exploitation of vulnerability. And it's very hard, or, or um, web application attack. Well, OWASP has like a top 20 that you kind of have to shovel in there. Now what MITRE does is to say, okay, well, it's, it's a web attack. Here are 10 attack groups and the tactics that we've seen publicly documented or the approaches, and so that's what you can gather for. But what vendors will often do is they'll pick a couple of items, they'll put up on their dashboard, hey, we got tactic 1035 and tactic 372, and now we're doing MITRE. But when you really look at your coverage across your various vendors that you've bought into and put on top of each other, you're probably going to find that you're overlapping in certain areas and you've got four tools looking for the same few commands and you're missing everything else. So that's why I think it's valuable to ask that question and say, okay, what exactly are you doing? And, and the thing is, if they're doing the MITRE ATT&CK framework, they must have done the mapping at some point. So it shouldn't be hard for them to provide you what that mapping looks like. And I think it's kind of a, a warning signal as well if they're humming and hawing about that. All right, hopefully that was helpful. But I got a thumbs up, so I think that's okay. This is great. Uh, we, um, we're going to stop the, the public Q&A right now, um, which is, might be available yep. on the side uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. But please uh, help me uh, thank you, Richard, for his helpful presentation. Okay. Thank you.